Okay, so I'm going to introduce differential forms today. Uh, all of this is going to be kind of in the build-up to discussing the cotangent space, but for now I'm just going to think about differential forms kind of out of the context of manifolds and just as new objects in their own right. So I'm going to talk about differential forms over the space of Rn, or Rd, partly because this is a simple situation and partly because that's all we're really going to need to generalize to manifolds. So to do this discussion I'm going to need to introduce quite a lot of new machinery that might be fairly unfamiliar to you. So I would encourage you really to stick with it because it can be confusing at first and until you've really seen the whole picture you don't really have a feel for what's going on. So I encourage you to stick to the end, no rewatch if you get confused. So in the spirit of just defining new things, let's begin with the simplest type of form, which is a zero form. So this is the notation that we're going to use. This number is known as the degree of the form, and we would usually call an arbitrary form, say a Q form or any other number that you like. So the simplest type of form, a zero form, is simply just a function. So now some new notation capital omega, which I'm going to use to stand for the space of all forms of degree q, in this case zero. So the space of all zero forms now over our d, which is the space that we're talking about. So with this definition that zero forms are functions, we identify the space of all zero forms is just simply the space of all smooth functions. Okay, so this is just a simple redefinition or realization. Functions are zero forms. So, okay, nothing new has happened yet. I've just sort of identified or relabeled functions to be zero forms. So, now to go about constructing higher degree forms, so one and two forms, etc., I'm going to need to introduce a new piece of machinery known as the exterior derivative. Okay, so the exterior derivative, I'll just now define, is going to be a map, given the symbol d, and it is going to be like a derivative, as we'll see shortly, but for now we're just going to define it as a map that maps you from the space of q forms over our d, which I won't bother to write, into q plus 1 forms. So, say for example, the exterior derivative of a zero form is going to give us a one form. So let's see this now. I'm simply going to define for you the action of the exterior derivative on a zero form. So let's take an arbitrary zero form. I'm going to call it f. And now the exterior derivative, df, is defined in the following way. Okay, so this definition, it's simply a definition for now, we're not going to understand too much what it means yet, but we should realise that this df is now a single object by itself, which is now a one form. So this is just the definition, let's try and understand a little bit more what it means. Since this function I wrote here was arbitrary, let's consider taking <clears throat> the exterior derivative of a function that we know and have immediate access to which are these coordinate functions. So what I'm going to do is calculate the exterior derivative of the coordinate function. Kind of what I've written here, and we're now just going to see what this actually is. So in the spirit of this definition, it's just going to be the partial derivative of our function, which is the coordinate function now, with respect to the coordinate function, but to remain consistent with my indices, I need to introduce a new index just to avoid having more than one pair of the same index. So then I just have to multiply by this new thing, dx new, which we don't really know what it is yet. But now you should be quite happy in saying that this is going to be the Kronecker delta, because we defined our coordinates to be independent. If this is dx1, 
dx1 is not a function of dx2, say. Stated another way, our coordinates are independent, they're not functions of each other. So this is all just going to collapse when we take this Kronecker delta sum to just dx mu again. So we've seen that dx mu is equal to dx mu. We'd obviously hope this was true. But now we really understand what dx mu is, it's simply just the exterior derivative of our coordinate functions. Okay, so now we can realize something. These dx mu objects are special in the sense that they appear in the definition of an arbitrary exterior derivative. So we can kind of single these dx mu's out and identify them as being special objects, and they are in fact the basis objects. So I haven't told you this, and I'm probably going to get told off by some mathematicians now for saying this is true, but this space of one forms is effectively a vector space. Technically it's not a vector space, it's something called a C infinity M module. That's really going to be unnecessary for us to go into. For our purposes it's going to be close enough to a vector space that we can just treat it like a vector space. So these dx mu objects, they form the basis of this vector space of one forms. And now, since it's a vector space and these dx mu's are our basis elements, we know that we can express any arbitrary vector, or now one form, in the space as a linear combination of our basis objects, our basis one forms. Okay, so a really quick recap then. We began by identifying or just defining that zero forms are functions on our D, smooth functions on our D. I then introduced a new bit of machinery, which is known as the exterior derivative, which we said was a map from Q forms into Q plus one forms. And I then showed you how this exterior derivative acting on a zero function produces a one form. And we were able to identify from the definition of the exterior derivative that these dx mu objects are the exterior derivative acting on the coordinate functions and these are forming the, the basis of our uh, space of one forms. So then any one form in the space can be expressed as an arbitrary linear combination of these basis one forms. And now one thing that you should realise as we're going to be moving on to consider manifolds eventually, these x mu's which I'm writing at the moment are just the coordinates on our d when we generalize to manifolds, these x mu's are going to be our coordinate charts, our chart functions essentially. So writing dx mu in this way, it feels dependent on coordinates, but the x mu is still arbitrary. We haven't defined our coordinates yet. When we define our coordinate chart, the one form will have a realization in that chart. Okay, so from zero forms, we can form one forms using the exterior derivative. Now in order to, to form higher degree forms, I'm going to need to introduce a final piece of machinery, which is known as the exterior, or more commonly, the wedge product. Okay, so the wedge product, it's going to be a product, so it's going to need to map essentially a pair of inputs. So it's going to be a map, which is given the symbol wedge, from now the space of Q forms and a space of P forms. Since the wedge is a product, it has to map two inputs and it's simply going to map a Q form and a P form into a Q plus P form. So now using these two operations, the wedge and the exterior derivative, we can essentially construct any degree form starting from our most basic zero form. So now this wedge product is a very special product. It has to be what's known as anti-symmetric. So if I just consider the wedge product now acting on one forms for the sake of simplicity, if I have two one forms, tau and omega, this wedge product is going to form a two form since it's a one plus one equals two form. So I could say call this two form, say zeta, but now this wedge product has to obey the 
anti-symmetry property, which means that if we swap these two one forms over, we have to pick up a minus sign. Okay, so this is the key property that the wedge product has to satisfy anti-symmetry. So the wedge product of any two one forms has to be anti-symmetric. And then we can just quickly generalize this to arbitrary degree forms if tau wedge omega, if tau is say a p form, I'll just put in brackets up here, and omega is a q form, then the product is anti-symmetric when p times q is essentially an odd number. Okay, so that's all the machinery we're going to need. I'm now gonna go through and show how we would construct a two-form.